In Jesus' name we pray. And the good, gracious people of God said, Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for yet another time, another privilege we have to come to receive from you. Lord, we pray you open the windows of heaven now and pour your abundance upon your people in Jesus' name. Lead us to the rock that is higher than us. And from that rock, Jesus Christ who was meeting on a cross of Calvary. We pray, O oh Lord, abundance of heavenly blessing will come upon everyone in Jesus' name. The fullness of your salvation, the fullness of your deliverance, the fullness of your presence, the fullness of your holiness, and the fullness of the power of the Holy Ghost pour upon your people now in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, the dry ground will become the fertile ground. We pray, Lord, the lukewarm will come on fire for the Lord in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, the abundance of the Lord coming out of the throne of God will come into every heart, every life, every family, and everything we lay our hands upon. And this church will have, will possess, and will feel the glorious power of the Lord upon our lives in Jesus' name. Be glorified in the midst of your people today. And let every need be satisfied. And every lack be supplied. Until your people will know that heaven has poured out abundance upon every life in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. We can sit down. We come to this important message. Every message is important, but you know, when you come to something like this, and you're looking at the deep well of the Lord, and you're looking at the great provision that God has for his own people, it rejoices your heart that you can make such a discovery in the word of the Lord. And I pray that this discovery will be yours in Jesus' name. We're looking at Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Divine supply and sufficiency from the smitten rock. Divine supply and divine sufficiency coming from the smitten rock. Exodus chapter 17, reading from verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. After their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people, they charged, they quarreled, they fought, they were angry. Therefore the people, they charged with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why charge ye with me? Why fight ye with me? Why quarrel with me? Why are you out of your mind? Keep your cool. Why do you charge with me? And then it says, Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? You know, every time you have a need, every time you have a problem, and instead of praying, pray with faith, pray with expectation, and praying with holding on to the promises of God, instead of praying with faith and love and expectation, you chide, you quarrel, you fight, you get angry. It's a temptation to the Lord. You're tempting the Lord. Then it says, Where, wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses. They murmured against Moses. He was the leader God appointed him. And he was to lead them to the land of promise. And they murmured against him. And then it says, Wherefore is this, that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, 
to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. And Moses cried unto the Lord, thank God for leaders who pray. I said, thank God for leaders who pray. You know, left to the children of Israel, they remain in their thirst, in their need, in their lack, in their scarcity. But Moses prayed unto the Lord. And then it says, what shall I do unto these people? They'll be almost ready to stone me. Think about that in verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in hurry, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. That's how God satisfied their thirst. That's how he supplied their need. The rock was there. And the rod was in the hands of Moses. And the Lord God Almighty said, Smite the rock. And enough water will come out. And so he did that. We're told in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Looking at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not, I don't want you that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did eat, did all eat the same spiritual meat and he did all drink the same spiritual drink. Think about this now. The New Testament is making application of what we have read in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was manna, physical, normal bread that they ate to satisfy their physical need, their hunger. But now it says they ate the same spiritual meat. What was physical, natural, Material in the Old Testament is not spiritualized. And the Lord is telling us in this passage we are reading that what we saw in the Old Testament becomes something spiritual in the New. That you look at the spiritual implication, application in your life. The provision the Lord will make. And then he talks about the water out of the rock. And instead of just talking about the ordinary water that they drank, that satisfied their physical thirst. Now it says they drank of that spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was who? Christ. And the rock was Christ. Divine supply and divine sufficiency coming from the smitten rock is referring to Christ there. What do we have as the spiritual drink? The water. And you're going to see how the word of God, even Christ himself, how he used that water. What he made that water to represent. And you will see what the water is supposed to supply in our lives. And to give us a sufficiency of the blessing coming from the smitten rock. Coming from Calvary. Number one, free salvation through the smitten Christ. Free salvation. Free salvation. Free salvation coming from the smitten rock. Smitten Christ. Number two, full sanctification not partial entire complete final full 
full sanctification through the smitten Christ. You see that water that he drank? First Corinthians chapter 10 says, they all drank out of the spiritual drink. Everything becomes spiritualized. The free salvation. The full sanctification. Number three, the fullness of the spirit through the smitten Christ. The fullness of the spirit through the smitten Christ. Number one, what's number one again? I said what's number one? Preach it, tell me. Free salvation through the smitten Christ. Christ. Now to start with, Christ was smitten and Christ was crucified. Look at what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, I'm reading from verse 4 and verse 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. And afflicted, smitten, smitten of God and afflicted. He was smitten when he was crucified, when he was nailed to the cross, when the blood came out of his side. And then it says he was smitten of God. Why was that for our salvation? Look at verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with the stripes, tell me, were healed. Physical healing, spiritual healing, salvation for the soul, salvation for the spirit, salvation that takes us from here to heaven. And then in verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray and have turned. Everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That shows you then this water that came out of that rock. It's representing the water of cleansing. The water of salvation. The water that represents salvation, forgiveness, redemption, Unto the people of God. See how the Lord Jesus connected water with salvation. Let's see in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 10. John chapter 4 verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that says to thee, Give me to drink. He would, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. You see that? The smitting Christ, the smitting rock, giving us the water of life, living water. The woman says unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? And thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. You understand? The woman was thirsty for pleasure. That's why she went from man to man. And the Lord said, when I give you this water, this water of life, this living water, You'll not be thirsty for the pleasure of the flesh anymore. The woman was, was thirsty for the things this world could offer. And Jesus Christ didn't want to tell her directly. He didn't want to, you know, Jesus Christ was not a confrontational preacher. 
He was a wise savior. And he wanted to draw this woman into salvation. That's why he said, you are thirsty for many things and you're not satisfied with one man, the other man, the other man, the other man, number five. And now you're with number six and there's no satisfaction yet. And then because you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But whosoever will take the water, the living water from me, he will never, never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Then Jesus Christ spoke about salvation. And he said, I'll give you the water. And when I give you that water, you'll never, never thirst anymore for the things you'll be thirsty for. And the Lord is telling us the same thing. The smitten rock, the smitten Christ, the living water, that salvation that comes from Christ, from his side, from his hands, and is poured out unto us. When you taste that water, you'll not be thirsty for worldliness anymore. You'll not, be, you'll not be thirsty for adultery, fornication anymore. You'll not be thirsty for many men, a man, a man, a man, or a woman, a woman, a woman again. No. There'll be a change. Your thirst will be satisfied. The joy of the Lord will so fill you and saturate your life that the things you used to run after, you used to pursue, the things of this world, all that will vanish away. You'll not be thirsty for more money, more money, more money. Never satisfied. The water that I shall give you will spring up in you and become life everlasting. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 12. Water representing salvation. Water representing the satisfaction that comes from knowing the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 12. I'm looking at verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust, I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my son. He also is become my salvation. Look at verse 3. Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of where? The wells of salvation. That water then represents salvation. You know the children of Israel as they came out and the Lord wanted to use them for an example so that we come in generations after we will see how to be able to have something to satisfy our souls, satisfy our heart, satisfy every need that we have. And that water that came out of the rock in the wilderness, the wilderness of this world makes us thirsty, thirsty for many things. And we're looking for this and we think, if I get this, I'll be all right. If I get that, I'll be all right. Didn't you think like that in your life? When you're very young, if I get certificate, I'll be all right. You got it now. You're not all right yet. You're still thirsty. When I get a job and then I'm well placed, I'll be all right. You got a job. Are you all right? And then when you give me promotion, they give me promotion and increase my salary by 5%, 10%, I think I'll be okay. That will be final for me. But they did that. And after the promotion, that week you are all right. That month you are all right. After about three months or four months to say, what am I going to do with this? I need more. It never satisfies. It's when I get married. Because, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting a kind of developed and I'm matured now. I feel it in my body, in my life. This loneliness, I want to take care of it. When I get married, I'll be all right. You got married now. Are you all right? No. Well, you're not set for what woman. If I get another woman, this one is getting stale. This one is not, is not satisfying me anymore. And then you got another one. Are you satisfied yet? No. It never satisfies. When I have children, that will finalize everything. I'm just asking, Lord, all oh, this is what I'm looking for. The only thing I'm looking for, a child, a child, a child. But you got the child now. After getting the child, are you satisfied? No. You see, whatever it is to get in this world, you'll drink out of this water and you will thirst again. 
but the water that I shall give unto you will be in you well of salvation, life eternal, rivers flowing into life eternal. Therefore, that's why it says in verse 3, Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. The Lord is telling us, then come and take that water of life. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, and we're reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 55, reading it from verse 1. O everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. You see that again? That's the water the Lord is talking about. Water of life. The living water that he wants to use to cleanse, to purge, to satisfy, and to fulfill your heart's longing, not only in this world, but in the world to come. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that has no money, come ye by, and eat. Come ye, come by wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hacken diligently unto me. That's the condition again, listen attentively. With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, pay attention. It says, hacking unto me, diligently unto me, and eat. Then it says, eat ye. That which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David, verse 6, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. That's how to get the water. That's how to get the salvation. That's how to get the righteousness. That's how to get that life eternal. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked do what? Tell me out loud. That's the way to be able to have this water of life. This living water. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Is the thoughts that produce the action. Is the thought that produces the behavior. Is the thought that generates the, the, the conduct. Is the thought that makes you do what you do. And if you're unrighteous, if you're unsaved, if you're a sinner, it says, let the wicked forsake his way. And the righteous man is thus, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Can we have an amen there? Abundantly, abundantly pardon. When God pardons us, forgives us, there's a change of life. There's a turning around. There is a transformation. He forgives, yes, he forgives, yes, he forgives. But when he forgives, he cleanses us too. John chapter 8, verse 11. Well, abundantly pardon. Abundantly pardon. Merciful God. Loving God. Abundantly pardon. With that forgiveness comes a transformation. A change of life. A new life. Righteousness. John chapter 8, verse 11. She said, No man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. That's the, that's the forgiveness and the mercy of God. But go and do what? Tell me out loud. Go and sin no more. They caught the woman in adultery in the very act. And the law of Moses would have killed her. The people were thirsty of her blood. And he said, Jesus, what do you say? And he said, whosoever among you does not have any sin, let him cast the first stone. They all went away condemned. 
And Jesus said, where are those your accusers? As no man condemned you, he said, no man, Lord. And the Lord said, I forgive you. I'm a merciful God. The water of life flowing out of me will reach out to you. But go and sin no more. He gives us the power to go and sin no more. You'll be free from today in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. After forgiveness, there's a clean life. After forgiveness, there's a holy life. Romans chapter 6, we're looking at verse 18. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Free from sin. Free from sin. You became the servant of righteousness. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become Servants to God, ye have your fruit unto, tell me the word, tell me the word, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. Why is there no condemnation? We're forgiven. Our sins are taken away. The condemnation is gone. The damnation is gone. And it's coming out of the smitting rock. Coming out of the smitting Christ. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And as your Lord. That life eternal flows into you. It says there's therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me, what? I pray you'll be free. I said you will be free. Free from the yoke and free from the chains of sinning. That he has made me free from the law of sin and death. He sets us free and I pray that you'll be a partaker of that freedom in Jesus' name. Point number two, full sanctification. Complete sanctification. Entire sanctification. Beautiful. The beauty of holiness in the lives of the people that behold the smitting rock. And that power to live above not just the external sin, even the inward sin. That power comes into our lives and it sets us completely free. And today, you are free. I said today, you are free. And remember, we're talking about water. We're talking about water. I was saying that that water that flowed out of the rock is representing the fullness of the spiritual blessing coming out of the side of Christ. Look at the water now. We've seen the water as salvation. Now we want to look at the water as the means for our sanctification. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. What a message. Husband, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for the church for it, that he might what? That he might that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of what? Water by the word. You see that that water that came out of the rock, now we have another side to it. And the side we have to it here is that the water is what God will use and then will bring sanctification will bring holiness, will bring purity into your life, into my life, into the life of the whole church. The son, the daughter, the father, the mother, the whole family, the young and the old, the leaders and the led, the followers, sanctification, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It is effected by the water coming out of the side of the rock, of the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 26 again, Ephesians chapter 5. That he might sanctify, that he might purify, that he might purge, that he might cleanse, that he might sanctify and cleanse seed with the washing of water by the word. And that 
he might present ye to himself a glorious church. Is that water that comes out of the sight of Christ? Because when they struck him, water came out and blood came out. And now he says, it's by the means of that was coming out of Christ. That's how we get sanctified. So that the church will be, he'll present the church to himself. A glorious church. Not having a spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. The Lord will do it. I said the Lord will do it. You know, sometimes when the Lord repeats something once, twice, three times, four times, over and over, you must have an intention to get it done and see how the Lord has been leading us through and through. Yesterday it was emphasized, and today it's been emphasized again that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The repetition is for emphasis. The repetition is to remind us that this is the very heart of God. We're looking at the symbol, we're looking at the water, and we're seeing that that water also is going to produce, is going to grant us the holiness and the sanctification by the way the promise has been given to us. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, we're looking at it from verse 69. And he has raised up and hung of salvation. For us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all, not only of some, of all that hate us. A sacrifice of Jesus that makes that possible. Preservation from the enemy. Protection from the enemy. Power that prevails over the enemy. is Christ that makes that available. And then verse 72 to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant. The oath which is swear to our father Abraham. That he will grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without without what without fear without fear what will they say if i give all my life to the lord what will they say if i live a holy life holy life in the home holy life in the office only life in the neighborhood. Only life among religious people. What will they say? Will they not say, what are you trying to do? We'll be together. And we'll be walking this way together. Do you want to show that you are better than us now? Don't be afraid of what they're going to say. Here is the provision of the Lord. And here is what the qualification that gets you ready for heaven above. So it says that we might serve the Lord without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. You know, sometimes when you read that, you are asking yourself, is that possible? In holiness and righteousness before the almighty God, not just before man, before him. And then it says all the days days of our lives. You think about that. And say, can anybody do that? Is that possible for anyone? Holiness and righteousness before God. All the days of our lives. You know, sometimes it gives us encouragement. When we've seen somebody, he has done what we're trying to do. He has gotten to the place we're trying to get to. And then all doubt is cleared away from your mind. And you say, if God can do it for him, if God can do it for her, God can do it for me. He will do it for you. I said he will do it for you. Holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. Are there people that have been like that before? I want you to write the word holiness. Holiness. You write the word holiness. You know how to spell holiness? 
I said you know how to spell holiness. God will spell it out in your life. I need an amen there. Holiness H. Ezekiah. Ezekiah. You know, if God did it for other people and they testified to it, and God never said, No, Ezekiah, you are telling a lie. That's not possible. You didn't live a holy life. He lived a holy life. Second Kings chapter 20. Second Kings chapter 20, verse 1. In those days was Ezekiah seek unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. He turned, then he turned his face to the wall and he prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. It was possible for Ezekiah, it will be possible for you. I said it will be possible for you. And that's why the Lord added 15 years to his life. Didn't I tell you, holiness will go along with healing and happiness. Holiness, happiness, health. They go together. And because the man said, oh Lord, look at my life. I've been walking before you straight and with a perfect heart. And the Lord said, that's all right. I'm adding 15 years to your life. The Lord will prolong your life. The Lord will prolong your life. You will not die young. But long life will it satisfy you in Jesus' name. Oh, for Obadiah. Obadiah. First Kings. I'm reading First Kings chapter 18. He was walking in a difficult place. He was walking with Ahab. He was walking under the very eyes and the nose of Jezebel. But the man remained holy, remained righteous. Some people say, you know, Pastor, where I'm walking, that place, they're wicked. That place, they steal a lot. That place, if you don't steal with them, they'll mark you down. And look at what they will do. Those people are cultic. Ahab was a cultic, Jezebel was a cultic, and yet Obadiah lived a holy life. You will live a holy life. I said you live a holy life. In 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 3, And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And it was, it was so, when Jezebel caught off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them fifty by fifty in a cave and fetch them with bread and water. Can you think of three and a half years all the time of the farming when even Elijah himself, he was by the brook cherries, his, a, kind, a raven was bringing food to him and then this Obadiah when he saw this wicked woman Jezebel with the consent and agreement of Ahab the king, killing the prophets of God. He took 100, 100. Can you imagine somebody walking in the house of Ahab, a wicked man, a man that sold himself to do evil, and Jezebel, a witch, a sorcerer. And yet this man walking there, and the sorcery did not affect him. And the wickedness did not rub off on him. And he lived such a good life, righteous life, consistently. Every day, he kept those 100 prophets. And day after day, and week after week, and month after month, he will get out to them and feed them with bread and water. Righteous man. Now, L for Luke. L for Luke. Luke. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. And I want to show you that there are people that have lived before us. And the Lord kept them holy, kept them righteous. And if he kept them righteous and holy, he will keep us righteous in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. Colossians chapter 4 verse 14. Colossians chapter 4 verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Luke... The beloved physician. Who else is mentioned in that verse? I said who else is mentioned in that verse? Demas come to 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world. 
and is departed unto Thessalonica. You see, somebody that had been with Luke and then with Paul the Apostle, and they'll be going in and going out together, bosom friends, fellow workers together, fellow laborers together. Demons decided to backslide, and Luke said, that's you, that's you, that's you. I make up my mind. I'm still going to be following on. Look at verse 11. Verse 11, it says, only Luke is with me. And I was a beloved physician. He led the work of the doctor. I was just following Paul, the apostle, all about. And when you read Acts of the Apostles, every time he says, we, 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 that's Luke writing. He abandoned everything, total consecration, commitment to the Lord. And even when demons forsook this man of God, this Luke was still there. That's consistency. That's continuity. Continuing, even when others are backsliding. I for Isaiah. I for Isaiah. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm reading there from verse 5. Isaiah chapter 6. As you look at all these people, then you know that if you're going to live a holy life, it must be a personal decision. You'll not say, hey, you know, my friend, fellow laborer, fellow worker, my confidant is come back into the world. I don't have any encouragement anymore. How can I live a consistent holy life? Look at Luke. He kept on following the Lord, even though Demas led. Whoever stays, whoever lives, you will remain with the Lord in Jesus' name. In Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5, Isaiah has seen the glory of God. And when Isaiah saw the glory of God, he said, Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. The sanctification. He was saved before. Wasn't he the one that said, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, it shall be washed and you'll be white as snow. But now, after that salvation came the sanctification. He came before the Lord. He saw the glory of God. He saw the beauty of his holiness. As the angels cried, holy, holy, holy. He began to have this pursuit and passion, this desire. And he wanted this sanctification. He wanted this holiness. And then the fire of God was taken with the tongues from off the altar and touched him and said, this has touched that leaves. And now your sin is put. Everything is taken away. And the same God that did it for Isaiah, he will do it for you. I said he will do it for you. But you know why God did it for them? Because they wanted it. Because they pursued it. Because they prayed for it. Because they were passionate about it. Oh Lord, this is what I want. He did it for Ezekiah. He did it for Obadiah. He did it for Luke. He did it for Isaiah. He did it for Nehemiah. Nehemiah, I'm looking at chapter 13 of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. And we're looking at verse 23. Nehemiah. It was uh, the person that is bringing the cup that the king would drink, bringing it to the king. And yet, even in that palace, he was still able to live a righteous life. And when he heard that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, it broke his heart and he sent him weeping and calling upon the Lord. How could that happen? Until even the passion he felt and the desire he felt for the uh, walls of Jerusalem to be built again. The king saw that. He said, Nehemiah, you look sad. You look sorrowful. And you have not been like this before. I said, yes, O king, will I not be sorrowful? When Jerusalem, the city of my God, and Jerusalem, the abode of my father, says, broken down. And the walls are broken down. And the king said, what are you looking for? And then he said, if you send me, I'll go there and rebuild that wall. You see, when you are holy, you are passionate. 
When you're holy, you want to build up the walls. When you're holy, you are zealous. Zealous for righteousness. And you know people who say they're sanctified, they're holy. And when they see sin all around, it doesn't break their heart. When they see sinners remaining in their sins, it doesn't break their hearts. When they see backsliders going back and back and back, further and further into backsliding, it doesn't break their hearts. When they see people, drunk people, and drunk people are sometimes mad, and they begin to take the word of God in their mouth to jest with the word of God. They are, they are not they're not passionate it doesn't bring zeal in them for nehemiah when he saw that the walls protecting the heritage of the lord was broken down it brought kind of tears within him and then the king noticed that look at that Nehemiah now chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 23 in those days also i saw the jews that had married wives of ashdod and ammon and of Moab, and their children spoke half in the language in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak the pure language in the in the Jewish language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them. If you are holy, you'll earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Holiness does not make you look warm, cold. Lethargic. Holiness does not make you insensitive. Holiness does not immune you to the things around you. It gives fire in your soul and makes you to want everybody to get out of sin, out of rebellion, and come to the Lord. Here it says, when I saw them, I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their air and made them swear by the Lord, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto you, unto your sons, and offer yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like unto him, who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, 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 even him did outlandish women cause to sin. I pray they will not cause you to sin. I said they will not cause you to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, uh, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sambalat, the Horonite. The Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. I said, get out of here. You cannot be my partner. You cannot be my friend. Because you are friendly to the person who is an enemy of God. Remember them, oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levite. Then I cleansed those, I cleansed them from all strangers and appointed the, appointed the wards of the priests and of the Levites, everyone in his business. And then it said, and for the word of the offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my God, for good. That's holiness. That's holiness. A person of from such sin. And says, no, it will not take root. Sin will not take root in this our church. I said, sin will not take root in this our church. E for Enoch. E for Enoch. I'm looking at, I'm looking at Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, we're looking at verse 22. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. He was so holy. He was so righteous that the Lord said he will not even allow him to see death. He was going to go to glory without seeing death. And if God did it for them, he'll do it for you. I said he'll do it for you. Are you there? He will do it for you. Ezekiah, holy. Obadiah, holy. Luke, holy. And then Isaiah, holy. And Nehemiah, holy. Enoch, holy. I will be like them. I said I will be like them. 
Now we come to another S, Samuel. Samuel. And you know that Old Testament character? How the Lord walked in his life from his youth even to adulthood. And see what the, what the Bible says about him in Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 15. And we're looking at verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, though Moses and Samuel stood before me. Think about God now pairing Moses and Samuel. Because Samuel lived a righteous life. A holy life. And he did that from the very when he was young until when he, he became old. And see the testimony of this Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. How he challenged the people, confronted the people and said, You can witness against me whose ox have I taken. And what have I coveted of anything that belongs to anybody? 1 Samuel chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 3. Behold, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Of whose hand have I received any bride to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it. And the search that was not defrauded us and of no oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught from any of any man's hand. If those people could make it, we will make it. I said we will make it. Do you remember when Samuel was young, Ophni and Phineas were there? Wicked people. Wicked children of Eli. As terrible as they were. As polluted as they were. As sinful as they were. Samuel held on to the conviction that the Lord has brought him to. And if you are really having the grace of God in your life. And that water flowing from the side of Christ touches your life, comes upon your life. I'm telling you that this holiness, the Lord will bring it out in your life in Jesus' name. The final S is Stephen. The final S is Stephen. That man was holy. That man was pure. That man was sanctified. And see what they did. See what they did. And yet, no anger, no bitterness. Think about this. Holiness gets rid of anger. Holiness gets rid of the fury the fury of the unbeliever. You know the people. People get easily angry. Easily angry. No water. They're angry. The food is late. They're angry. And something doesn't go the way they want. They're angry. And the anger will bring some action. That you say, hey, so and so is angry. And I know no people that say, brother, so and so is angry. Brother, anger. Brother, anger. Sister, so and so is angry. Sister, anger. Sister, anger. Jesus said that that anger can lead to hellfire. Get rid of it. When you're saved and you're sanctified, it takes the anger away from you. You can be a teacher and not get angry. You can correct your children and not get angry. You can correct your workers and not get angry. But you see, in the case of Stephen, he was holy. And the holiness brought out the character, spotless character in him. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. And I'm reading there from verse 51. Ye stiff necked uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? You know, you can, you can be holy and still preach the truth. You can be holy and still tell liars that they are liars. You can be holy and still tell murderers they are murderers. You can be holy and still tell the truth about people. Telling the truth and preaching the truth even forcefully doesn't make you unholy. It says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have be now the betrayers and the murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were caught to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, 
looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. If you are holy, when you are about to go home, you'll see the glory waiting for you. You see the Lord waiting for you. And you see your mansion that the Lord wants you to possess. And then he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their clothes at the, at the young man's feet. And then it says whose name was Saul. And he stood Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He wasn't angry. He wasn't angry. And then he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not their sin to their child. Forgive them. Have mercy on them, Lord. And when he had thus said, he fell asleep. I want to tell you that's one of the prayers that converted Saul. Paul the apostle came to the kingdom because this man prayed and said, don't count this sin against them. Forgive them. If the Lord has done this by the smitting rock, the smitting Christ, he was smitting, he was crucified so that you can be holy like Ezekiah, holy like Obadiah, holy like Luke, holy like Isaiah, holy like Nehemiah, holy like Enoch, holy like Stephen, holy like Samuel. The Lord will do it for you. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Point number three now. Point number three. We're looking at the fullness of the spirit. The fullness of the spirit through the smitting rock. I want to remind you once again through the smitting Christ. I want to remind you once again that the rock was smitten and water came out. And I'm showing you from the word of God that that water, number one, represents salvation. Number two, that water represents sanctification. Number three, that water represents the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Think about that. The fullness of supply and the sufficiency of what is coming out of the rock. Look at that water now, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We're reading from verse 37. John chapter 7, verse 37. It says, in the last day, that great day, day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's the water again. That's the water again. And it's a smitting rock that produces the water. Living water for salvation living water for sanctification, living water for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Everything we need to have that will make all our sins to be forgiven. Everything we need to have that will make us pure, righteous, and holy. Everything we need to have that will give us the power of the Holy Ghost is coming out of that smitten rock, out of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow Rivers, rivers, rivers of living water. Verse 39. But they spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. That water of the Spirit came from Christ. And that baptism of the Holy Ghost is coming upon you today. The power of the Holy Ghost is coming upon you today. And when he comes, when he comes, there'll be a refreshing in your life. I said there'll be a refreshing in your life. A revival in your life. A renewal in your life because of the water flowing from Christ. The Holy Ghost power baptism coming upon the saved, sanctified people. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse 33. Acts chapter 2 verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shared forth this which ye now see and hear. That's the Holy Ghost baptism. He was exalted by the hand of the by the right hand of the Father, and now he sent that unto us. And that promise is just today. I said that promise is just today. 
Verse 39, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Salvation is for you. Sanctification is for you. Holy Ghost baptism and power is for you as well. Do you believe that? I said, do you believe that? If you believe it's for you, where are you? Why don't you raise up your hand? Where are you? Your belief is for you. The promise is unto you and to your children and to many that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Why don't you stand up then and say, Lord, this is for me. This is for me. When the water came out of the rock in the wilderness, everybody drank. Everybody drank. Everybody drank. I'm going to drink now. I'm going to drink now. I'm going to drink now. The water, the water of life, the river of life, flowing from the side of Christ is coming to you right now. Why don't you tell the Lord, oh Lord, I am ready. Oh Lord, I am ready. Oh Lord, I'm ready. Fill me up. Fill me up to saturation to overflowing. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. If you're thirsty, you can drink. Draw salvation out of the well. What joy. You draw that salvation out of his will and say, Lord, I need that salvation. I need that freedom. If you drink of this ordinary water, you will thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I shall give you, that water will become in you. Rivers of living water flowing out, flowing out, flowing out. You'll not thirst again. You will not thirst again. You will not thirst for adultery again. Thirst for fornication again. Thirst for drunkenness again. Thirst for smoking again. Thirst for the things of the world again. This water of life, the living water, will bring such rest, such satisfaction, such contentment that your life will be totally turned around, totally changed. Salvation. Be clean. Be cleansed. And then sanctification. Sanctification. For Jesus, that he might sanctify the people he suffered without the gate. By that suffering, by that atonement, by the shedding of the blood of Christ, he gives us the means for our sanctification. He gives us the means for holiness. We have no excuse. We have no excuse. Those who have lived before us. They made it. They made it. The environment was unclean. They were clean. The people around them were unrighteous. They were righteous. The people around them were corrupt. But they came out pure, having integrity, righteousness. And the Lord is saying, it's not tired of sanctifying people. It's not tired of making people holy. Counting all that anger about. Be clean. Be purged. Be purified. Sanctified. And then the power of the Holy Ghost. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this is said of the Holy Ghost which they that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Christ was not yet glorified. But then he went to heaven, 
and being glorified by the right hand of the Father. He has shed forth the gift of the Holy Ghost, which he do see and hear. And the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Baptized with the Holy Ghost. Enveloped in the Holy Ghost. Empowered, energized by the Holy Ghost. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's unto you free salvation. It's unto you full sanctification. It's unto you the fullness of the Spirit. Everything available for you. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for you. He will do it for you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be sanctified. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost. The promise of salvation. The promise of sanctification. The promise of spirit baptism. Everything, everything, everything unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. If you believe that what is coming to you now, in Jesus' name we pray. Living water, living water, flow to your soul, to your heart, to your spirit, to your body, to your life. In Jesus' name we pray. You will drink, you'll never be thirsty again. And all the things of the world you were thirsty about before, you were reaching after before, and you were looking for before, all those things are gone. Even today, as this water of life, the living water is coming into your life today. In Jesus' name. If you believe, and since you believe, and as you believe, the overflowing will come. I said the overflowing will come. Full salvation will come. And full sanctification will come. And the fullness of the Spirit of God will come in Jesus' name. Raise up your hand to the Lord Father in the name of Jesus. We thank you because the water that came out of the rock in the wilderness is symbolizing and presenting for us the water of salvation and the water of sanctification and the water of the Holy Ghost baptism coming from the side of Christ and from the hand of Christ unto everyone now we receive in Jesus' name. And as that water of life, the living water comes upon everyone now, all the things were thirsty for before. We're not thirsty for them anymore. We're not thirsty for worldliness anymore. We're not thirsty for sin anymore. We're not thirsty for evil anymore. We're not thirsty of the love of money anymore. Oh Lord, set everyone free in Jesus' name. And then the water of sanctification that cleanses, that purges, and purifies, and makes holy and makes righteous. Oh Lord, I pray that purity coming from the throne of God. Give it to every child of God in Jesus' name. Make us holy. Make us holy. Make us pure. Make us righteous. The people like Ezekiah, Lord, like Obadiah, Lord, like Luke, Lord, like Asa, Lord, what you did for them, do for every one of us in Jesus' name. Like Nehemiah was not lukewarm, like Nehemiah on fire, zealous for the Lord. And he wasn't, you know, a so so Christian, he wasn't a so so believer, he wasn't a lukewarm person. When he saw sin, he dealt with sin. We pray, Lord, all our leaders in this church, all our pastors in this church, 
all our overseers in this church, all our workers in this church, all the section leaders in this church will be like Nehemiah in Jesus' name. We will not excuse sin. We will not gloss over sin. We will not jest at sin. We will not play with sin. And anywhere, in anyone, a young fellow, an old fellow, an old timer, a newcomer that claims to be saved and claims to be a member of this church. Oh Lord, where we see sin, we will deal with it. We'll deal with it according to the word of God in Jesus' name. This church will be holy through and through. This church will be sanctified through and through. We we'll pray, Lord, that same fiery zeal of Nehemiah, you put in every heart, every coordinator group, coordinator, every man, every woman coordinator, and every woman rep, everyone serving you here in Jesus' name. Like Enoch walk with you every day for the whole of his life. From the age of 65 to 365. Lord we pray that same grace give to us. That same godliness give to us. That day after day and week after week and month after month. Whatever people around us are doing. Will remain standing in this holiness in Jesus name. Like Samuel make us holy and keep us holy. Like Stephen Lord no anger again. Lord, no anger again. Take it away or put it from every heart, every life in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, the fire of the Holy Ghost, the water of the Holy Ghost, and the power of the Holy Ghost will come upon every life. That Lord will go on in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Lord, in the energy of the Spirit. I will go out conquering and to conquer in Jesus' name. But we shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. I will be witnesses unto Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Lord, confirm it in every life in Jesus' name. I will pray that from this very day, everyone that has partaken of this today, you will never be the same again. This water will satisfy your heart. And then every day and every day and every day, you'll be renewing your consecration and commitment to the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know it has happened. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, and the faithful people of God, the believing people, the holy people of God said, I pray that what you have got will remain forever in your life in Jesus' name.